a professional, I'm not an expert, I was speaking as a concerned mother. So I came to Sonoma looking for some clean dirt to grow food, um, to raise some chickens, and let my children play in mud. Instead, I found men in hazmat suits and gas masks, first spraying the vineyard across the street from my school and my house. And then, a few weeks ago, tearing down a lead paint barn across from the playground where my son was playing, signaling the conversion we're talking about tonight. So, hazmat suits and children, the incongruity and the outrage of that moment for me is what gave birth to the creation of the Water Trough Children's Alliance just a few weeks ago. So, as a new agricultural project, seeks to begin next to the 700 children in the water trough schools. As parents, we feel it's our responsibility to make sure that what happens in that land is safe for our children. And our concern is really based on facts. Like almost 200, excuse me, two, two and a half million pounds of agricultural chemicals were used in Sonoma County in 2010. And only 200 of the more than 80,000 synthetic chemicals used in the U.S. have been tested under the Toxic Substances Control Act. And exactly none of them are regulated on the basis of their potential to affect infant or childhood development. No one is really looking at how much bioaccumulation is in our dirt and soils that we're living with. So that brings us to dirt. The dirt next to our schools, the dirt that my children love to play in. This dirt reveals the legacy of chemical farming practices from the past 100 years. And we now know that that legacy is also in our bodies and that we cannot control its effects. So let's start with lead arsenic and DDT, found in the orchard because it never leaves the soil. We now know the devastating effects of lead and arsenic, especially on children, even in minuscule amounts. DDT was once hailed as the savior of agriculture until we found it caused cancer, and it shows up in the tissues of our bodies years after it was banned. So then we have uh, the next chapter, organophosphates, lorspan, and diazinon, both banned for home use due to the extreme risks they pose to children, but still allowed for ad applications feet away from my son's kindergarten. So diazinon is an insecticide that originates from nerve gases the Nazis developed during World War II. Diazinon drifted onto the Apple Blossom campus one day in 1999. The farmer was fined the maximum $400, and the solution was spray in the morning and hose down the playground with water. So the positive moment, I guess, in our dirt story was in the 90s, which involved the highly toxic fumigant methyl bromide. It was going to be used in the soil during the last orchard to vineyard conversion next to the schools until the parents protested and the owner agreed, thankfully, not to use it. So there's hope. Um, that brings us to the current favorite herbicide of the day, Roundup. In 2010, Sonoma County applied over 54 tons of it, primarily in vineyards. Despite being billed as the softest of pesticides, Emerging science suggests maybe otherwise. And it's my fear that one day we may look back again, horrified by our ignorance. So we can see the dirt story next to our schools reads like a hazardous waste site. And I feel like it's time to break that legacy. This is really an issue of public health and safety for us. The current protections and systems of oversight for drift offers little assurance. There's no real mitigation measures in place that can contain chemical treatments from covering our children and our schools in such incredibly close proximity. My only recourse is to pursue a toxic trespass after the fact, after the damage has been done, and I can prove it. That's like trying to prove your cancer when you're 50 happened from an exposure of DDT when you're five. So it's time to shift this conversation from what's an acceptable level of risk to our children's health and what is the least toxic of toxic options, apples or grapes, to what we could envision would be a positive collaboration. 
between agriculture, food, farming, and culture that could move the next generation forward. And this is what we're here to consider as a community tonight. So I hope you'll join us. Thanks. So I'm also a parent. I have a child um, at the Sandwich Kindergarten. I have a child at the Sandwich Kindergarten. I have two more children who will um, eventually attend Sandwich, and the kindergarten is located across from the conversion site. And my motivation in getting involved in examining these issues is just um, to protect my children, to protect the well-being of the 700 children that attend school close to this site and close to the other agriculture sites there, and also to look at something county-wide and see if there was something that could be done for other children that are currently located next to active agricultural sites where there might be a drift issue. Um, I just want to recognize that we know these are huge questions. We know these are part of a larger dialogue that's taking place between a lot of people. We're specifically talking about children we're talking about school children, and we're talking about school children who are attending their neighborhood schools and what can be done to keep them safe. So we're not trying to address everything, although those, all those issues are important. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit about what we've been doing and what we've found. It's a little bit um, more specific to what we've been up to. So there's two issues that have come up for us as possible issues of concern. One being the conversion process itself, and two being future um, vineyard management practices. In relation to the conversion, when the trees are removed, there will be soil disturbed, and that soil could <laughs> this become airborne. This is my husband with the new copy of what I'm supposed to be saying. <laughs> Such is the life of uh, all of us. In any case, um, and that airborne soil could potentially, well, will most likely drift to other locations. So the question is, what's in that soil? Is that soil toxic? Is that soil potentially a problem for the children at these schools? And then the vineyard management practices is obviously what kind of things will be sprayed? When will they be sprayed? What will be used? How they'll be applied? Um, and will notice be given? Those kind of questions. So in trying to address these issues, we started with the Agricultural Commissioner, and he was kind enough to meet with us on multiple occasions. And he explained to us that the, I'm just going to give you a little bit about the process we've gone through for government agencies, so you can know kind of what we've come up against and what we're looking at. Um, and he explained to us that the permit process is ministerial, and there's no room for discretion, and if they meet the criteria, they can be issued a permit. Um, so we reached out to other agencies, and I'll just go through a few. Um, we have spoken to the school district. They are working um, with the land owner to possibly come up with an agreement that could um, you know, talk about application of pesticide, when it happens, how it happens, if there's going to be notice given. That's one avenue we've looked into. We spoke to some of the um, California Department of Toxic Substance Control. And although they were really sympathetic and genuinely concerned about what's going on, it's not in their purview what they can take action on. They're limited to land that is owned or leased by a school. Water people, air people, you know, with the dust drifts, we can make a report. Um, there's no dust ordinance in the county, there's no buffer zones, and there's no required soil tests. So what did we find? There's a gap. There is nothing right now that it addresses the conversion process or guarantees us that future vineyard management practices will take into account the children of these schools. So in order to address our concerns, we are asking the landowner, in this case, um, Paul Hobbs Winery, to voluntarily conduct comprehensive soil testing before the conversion. Um, you know, based on historical the history of conventional apple farming, which Nicole on, touched on, um, the pesticides that were used at the site, and that those are public record, um, and also a preliminary sample that was done, you can see that lead and arsenic and DDT are present. The question is, to what levels and where? This only tells us that comprehensive testing should be done before we proceed. 
Why? Because when this soil is disturbed, it will move, and it is these, this, this location is right next to schools, and that does put the children potentially at risk at those schools. And children, as we know, are more vulnerable to pesticide exposure. I'm going to wrap up here. I'm happy to talk more about this um, in any question and answer. Um, I just want to make clear that we have reached out to people to help us in this regard. And although the agricultural commissioner and the landowner um, you know, are, cannot be forced to do testing, it also would be imprudent to come back and say that children are not at risk without having real data to show that they're not at risk. And the only way to get data would be soil testing. So you can say, we're, not, we're willing to take the risk, but you can't say, we know children are not at harm, because testing would, would have to be done in a scientific manner, in a manner that took into account past farming practices, potential hotspots, where chemicals were mixed. They have to be done in a way that government agencies know how to do, like the Department of Toxicology, tux, tux, blah, blah, blah. that place, the California Department of Toxic Substance Control. So my time is up. I just want to say briefly that there are a lot of things that are being discussed about ways to prevent drift in the future. And um, those things are being discussed again voluntarily with the landowner. We are asking them, I know the agricultural commissioner is asking them, I know that the um, school district is working with them, but these are things that we have to ask to be implemented and there's nothing to force people to do them. The things they could do, they could be organic, they could get certified as sustainable, they could implement a dust mitigation plan, they could limit spraying, they could give notice, they could make a larger setback, they could create a greenway of a buffer between the two. They could increase the proposed, they're proposing to put some S. Valier apples along the fence, about 300 feet. That could be increased. That could be made much longer. Um, we've also been told, and I know nothing about this, but we've been told that they could use electrostatic sprayers and that may reduce drift. Something I'm going to leave to the experts. So these are all suggestions and these all relate to a good neighbor negotiation. In the future, what we want is something that doesn't leave our children's health to a good neighbor negotiation. We want county-wide buffer zones that could potentially protect children from any pesticide drift. And we have had indication that the Agriculture Commissioner is interested in working on this issue with everyone at the table to have input. And there are counties that are already doing that. Um, San Bernardino County, I just heard, got an email today that Santa Barbara ordinance, Santa Barbara County just passed an ordinance as well in this regard. Um, and I can answer any questions or talk to anybody about that later. My time is up, so thank you very much. Welcome, thank you for coming. Um, so as a parent, I'm a parent, my daughter goes to Orchard View School. As a parent and educator in farm-based education, I joined the WCA because I wanted to keep my daughter and the other students safe at school from potentially toxic chemical drift that occurs when orchards are converted to vineyards. And also, I was sick and tired of driving around the West County and seeing everything being turned into vineyards. We're losing farmland, we're losing farmland. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's frustrating me. I get emotional when I drive down and I see that's been torn down. Um, and so what, what's happening, and I'm sure you're all aware, is we're being surrounded by a monocrop. An agricultural system based on monocultures leads down one path, a path that includes increased dependency on synthetic chemical pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. And with the monoculture also comes the elimination of local food crops, livestock, and apiary products because grapes are not de-pollinated. Pesticides in the developing minds and bodies of our children don't mix. This is not new, it's something we know. And it's, it's evident that right now is the time to institute quarter-mile pesticide-free buffer zones around our schools. And we just heard from Cassandra, legislation is lacking in that regard. There was, I had her talk, there's concern about our small local farms and how this buffer zone affects them. And initially I was concerned about that as well. And then I read the crop report. So, let me get my marker. Uh, here are some numbers for you from the 2011 crop reports. No, we found the crop report. All right, let's see what I got. Hold on. I can talk loud for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have, uh oh, can I use this marker? It's washable. All right. Here's some numbers. You might be just right in there. I know. So, can everybody see? 
see that number? We have 60,184 acres of wine grapes in Sonoma County. We have... Twelve thousand eight hundred sixty-three combined acres of food crops, which includes everything that is not a grapevine: squash, melons, peppers, tomatoes, apples, grain, forage. All right, so let's let's look at these numbers and talk about organics in Sonoma County. Of this twelve thousand eight hundred sixty-three acres, we have seven thousand five hundred and twenty acres of organic crops. That is an additional 12,573 organic acres of pasture and rangeland because we like our organic beef and dairy products. All right, so let's go back to that first number for a minute. That's 60,184. How many wants to guess how many acres of grapevines are organic in Sonoma County? Anybody? 10,000. 5,000. All right, here's the measure. 178 acres. 10%. 10%. So, yeah, that is 1%. Clearly not appropriate or acceptable. So, ask if you can thank you. 1%. 1%. Thank you. Yeah, it's too late for now. <laughs> <laughs> it's 500 right in numbers. Thank you. Um, so, we pay an extra $2 for Neiman Ranch beef at local restaurants. We seek out organic local produce and cheese. Farmers market. We love good food and we love good wine. So why is it that we are not as concerned about the pesticides in the wine we drink as we are about the pesticides in the food we eat? As major players in our local agricultural community, thank you, holding more than 60,000 acres of agricultural land in Sonoma County, it is time for the wine industry to start picking up the slack. And it must, and we must insist that our government officials stop and think. Think about the impact of vineyard sprawl on our community, environment, and the local food system that we so enthusiastically support. Okay, I keep hearing about all the revenue wine growers bringing to our community, and so it is to them, the winemakers of Sonoma County. I say, now is your time. Now is the time to do better, time to give back to the community that you are a part of by converting these conventional vineyards to certified organic vineyards. And once that happened, buffer zones are easy because half over half of our agriculture is already organic when it's not related to grapes. So the, the pressure, the responsibility falls to the big players. They need to step it up. And I'm getting my wind up here. So I'm ever hopeful that as a community we can come together to find a way to keep our children safe from exposure to these toxic chemicals while at school and create once again biodiversity within our agriculture. So now, to touch on what Cassandra had said, as we move forward with yet another conversion of orchard to vineyard, we must insist that the property owner, Paul Hobbs Winery, as a respect responsible company wanting to avoid harm to any children, conduct a preliminary endangerment assessment via comprehensive soil test prior to proceeding with any part of this conversion, so we may better understand the impact of this specific conversion that it will have on our children and our community and our environment. And with that, I will leave you with these big numbers to think about where it all lies. Thank you very much. For <laughs> oh, and I'd like to introduce real quick our next speaker. We have Paula Shetkin from the Slow Food Save the Gravenstein Foundation. Welcome, Paula. Thank you. A slow food presidia is a special project where a community identifies a product that is iconic and has cultural and significant and cultural and historic significance to their community. Who knows? Who thinks that's Gravenstein apples here? Guess how many apples, acres of Gravenstein apples are left in Sebastopol? 
<laughs> Less than 600. Less than 600. And there's about 2,300 acres of apples left in Sebastopol. Um, slow food was founded in Italy in 1989 to counter the rise of fast food and the, the disappearance of local food traditions. We have local food traditions here that are all about apples. We have the Apple Blossom Festival, the Gravel Seed Fair, the Parade, and, um, and these are all important. When I first started this project, I drove around Sebastopol before I had a digital camera and took pictures of every street and every shoe store and every school that had the name Apple in its, in its, uh, in its logo or its sign. Uh, Presidia projects arose out of Slow Foods, Slow Foods' Ark of Taste. Think about the Ark, think about Noah's Ark, uh, which is an ongoing catalog of thousands of foods that are in danger. This is all about biodiversity. There are only six Presidia projects in all of the United States. There's only one in California, and this is it, the Gravenstein Apple Presidia. We have been doing this for 10 years, and I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here and to see a whole nother front. I understand that we're talking about pesticides here. I also understand that we're talking about conventional apple orchards versus organic, and you all should know that more and more and more of our, our apple orchards are organic. Uh, I, my last statement is that I want to talk about how we can coexist with agriculture. How many people of you know, how many of you know the farmer next door who grows the farm? Paul, John, people, who, there are farmers here. If you had talked to the Maninis in all the years that they were putting all that crap in the ground, might it have made a difference? I don't know. But we have to do that. And we have to learn here to eat seasonally and to eat locally. If we all ate apples that were grown in Sebastopol, and let me show you, there are over 50 varieties of beautiful apples that are grown in Sebastopol. If we ate them, if we valued them, and the farmers could make a better living growing them, some of this might have been uh, put aside, might not have happened. I just want to say one last thing. This is a farmer. This is a farmer who lives in our community, who coaches baseball, and whose kids went to school here. What's the difference? This is food. This is food. This is not wine, this is food. I drink wine, I love wine, but we need a balance here. And we're losing the balance, we've lost the balance, and it needs to change. Thank you.
sign our mailing list, which we have set up to stay informed and part of the work that we'll be doing in the future. You can like us on Facebook. And we have a website where we compile a lot of the research information that we've found, where we've been posting our press releases and the press that we've received and different um, announcements and information. And uh, that is on all our information packets, but it's www.watertroughchildrensalliance.bb.com. On an individual level, you can call the county supervisors and let them know that this is an issue for you. You can reach out to local government agencies to voice your concern, call and write to the press and, dis voice and discuss your point of view and share your personal stories. And if you'd like to get more involved with Water Trough Children's Alliance, we would love to have you. Um, there's a chance at the end of the meeting to meet with us, talk to us, and sign up in the back. There's an information table. And we have different committees forming, media, administration, legal, science, research, agriculture, fundraising, lobbying, political pressure. If any of these are your expertise, we'd love to know you. Uh, and clerical help, <laughs> technical help. Um, and we're so, we're so grateful to have each and every one of you here, honestly. And we're excited to carry on with the conversation. And um, we're going to take a quick 10-minute break and then reconvene and have a question and answer where the Water Trough Children's Alliance and all of its uh, members will be up here to answer your questions. Thomas and Rube will be leading that. And um, then we'll have an opportunity for community stories also. Please listen for the bell to come back for the break, from the break. And uh, thank you again. Being able to work this out in the future is that we listen to each other. And that we respectfully pay attention to views that maybe we don't share. But there may be nuggets that we can use going forward in trying to build alliances to make things happen. We all have to participate in this solution. This isn't going to happen because, you know, some number of people in the small little part of Western Sonoma County have an, uh, an issue. It has to be resolved by everyone. So I would ask you please, um, in the interest of time and respect, to hold your applause. Um, but to listen closely, the Ag Commissioner has agreed he's here to listen. Um, to what other people say. Thank you so much. And um, Anne Marie, you're up. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. It would be really helpful if you could say your name and um, what part of the county you live in. That would be great. Thank you. Anne Marie, Ad Hoc Committee for Clean Water. I've lived here about 32 years and live near Occidental. Uh, there's two things that are very important for you to know that you may have more strength than you realize. One of them, you should all write down, is in the California Code, and it's number 6614. And succinctly it states that no pesticide application shall be made or continued if there's a reasonable possibility. I'm sorry. It's question time. It's okay. A question. a question is, do you all know about <laughs>
Do you know that during the glassy wind sharpshooter controversy, none other than the California Department of Food and Agriculture, CDFA, in Sacramento, did an environmental impact report on aerial spray of pesticides. So if they did it for the entire state, why can't we do it for pesticide application here in Sonoma County? That's the last question somebody can try to answer. Thank you. My phone number, <coughs> by the way, because you probably don't know it, is 8743855. <laughs> I can just say thank you. We have looked into those and talked about it with Mr. Linegar. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm a friend of Joy Gables. Um, my name is Bill Stockton. Speaking of what? My name is Bill Stockton. I have a small apple, apple orchard in South Sumatra. <coughs> Uh, I am, it's organic and I intend to keep it that way. Um, I, my principal question here is the sort of the classic, uh, what did you know and when did you know it? How did you find out about this? Um, how could you have found out about this? How was this? There must be a process for the winery to get the permit and Things like that typically are sort of open to scrutiny by the public, and it's somebody's obligation to, uh, I would hope, present that information and, and sort of open open it for public input before the permit is granted. Maybe that's not the case. I really don't know. Um, but I'd like to know how you found out about it and what channels you were supposed to have found out about it through just in the ordinary process of branding and I'll take a little bit of this first. Um, well, I found out about the conversion on the WAC of boards, <laughs> our local community forum. And uh, thank you, Barry. And we, uh, you know, a lot of the parents found out when the barn and house at the property came down. And in, in my mind, in my opinion, it, it's, it was the, um, the school uh, supervisor, right, Barbara Bigford, um, it was her responsibility to tell us what was going on as being sort of our liaison to the world and what's happening at that campus and the surrounding property. Um, she found out um, in, in 2012, I think, when the, proper, when the transaction happened, and then I found out about two weeks ago. I think we all found out in different ways, right? Mainly when the buildings came down.
to Barbara Bickford as we were in escrow okay. on the property. Give her time. schools as we were in escrow on the property to be as totally obvious and, and, and okay. to be I'm good neighbors and good partners. Oh, she should have a, she should have a, a okay. segment. We'll answer in her order. So please, if you have more questions, she'll be happy to answer the time. She should have a... Full disclosure, my name is Steve Chancellor. Um, uh, I'm a farmer, not a public speaker, so I'm extremely nervous. I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, for the panel, I would like to know if any of you are farmers. I mean, I mean somebody that depends upon farming for their subsistence, to pay the bills. Not to garden or, you know, farmers. I can answer that question. I rely on agriculture to pay my bills. I am a farm-based educator. I work on an eight-acre organic apple orchard every week. I, I also raise horses and organic dairy goats. So as, as I grow my farm, I'd like there to be affordable land for me to buy, but it's being bought out from underneath me. I admire you for being a farmer, okay? And I'd like to reclaim that time for me.
And after I saw what Paul Hobbs Winery did to their neighbor, John Jenkel, I began writing on the site Yelp, both on the Yelp Talk and Yelp Reviews. And I was banned from Yelp. And I want to ask Tara Sharp if she said anything to Yelp that got me banned. Um, wait, can you, do you want me to answer that? Wait, I, just I, need mean, to, I need to understand what it is you want done. This is their meeting. They posted it. They organized it. They put the sweat and labor into it. So I just need to know what it is you want to have happen next. So I think what we've decided is is because there's so much tension between the question and answers that we're now opening it up to all commentary and, and question work commentary. So questions can be posed of anyone and answers can be made up from anyone. So statements are now. It looks like we're possibly moving or combining question and answer with community sharing, but still asking people to respect the time. And maybe they could announce at the beginning whether they'd like to make a statement or ask a question. Can, can we start with a, a, a chunk of time with Tara and perhaps a chunk of time for the farm person to just give I some... I think that would be a great idea. I think we um, would have to really respect time just because everybody wants to talk. So how about we, we, we got four minutes? Sure. So if we get the... It, it is now my understanding that the... Alicia would like to give five minutes to Tara and five four, minutes. Four. We got four minutes. Four five minutes to Tara and four minutes, four minutes to the Ag Commissioner. Is that correct? And then we will have an open exchange with questions and statements that are going to be two minutes. Is that what you said? Do you want to follow them? Okay, so let's have let's ask have Maven after the third. After the as a third speaker yes, with four minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay, then we will open it up to questions and answers and, and statements yeah. with the two minute limit. Is that what you want? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. We have an understanding. We have evolved beyond paper. Um, yay. So, you get what we're going to do now? Yeah. Okay, so first five minutes from Tara, second, four minutes, four minutes from Ag Commissioner, or vice versa. And then we'll go back to a two-minute discussion. Two minutes. Yes. And you're still available for answering questions, yes? Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Tony Linegar. I'm the Commissioner for Sonoma County. Um, there are just a couple of things that I wanted to go over here, just to provide a little context, a little background uh, for the conversation tonight. Uh, first, I want to start out with our BESCO program, because really all of this has come about um, as a matter of converting this orchard to a vineyard. And that process is overseen by our VESCO program, uh, which was originally put in place in the year 2000 by the Board of Supervisors. Um, this is actually a very sort of, uh, there aren't a lot of other counties, in fact, none that I know of, that have this sort of erosion control ordinance on the books. And back in 2000, there certainly weren't any counties that were really even looking at this. So. This ordinance has evolved over the years, and as it was mentioned last year, we added a whole new uh, chapter to our BMP manual on tree removal and standards for tree removal, because we, we saw that the vineyards were starting to reach up into some of the forested areas. We recognized that our standards did not really address tree removal as it relates to erosion, and I think that's the point I'd really like to drive home tonight. The VESCO Ordinance, Vineyard Erosion and Sediment Control Ordinance, that's the purpose of the ordinance, is con to control erosion and sedimentation with new orchard and vineyard development. That is the purpose, and it is a ministerial standard. So there isn't room for the county to exercise any discretion. We have laid out what the standards are, and if the project meets the standards, then it's approved. So that's how the program works. And while I have sat down um, with the water trough group on um, two different occasions now, um, I have provided them with all the information that they've requested, answered all their questions. I've actually had my staff members sit down and go over the plans for the development in detail. So we're, we're proud of the program. We're proud of the way the Agricultural Commissioner's Office administers the program, and we want to be as transparent and open in that process as we possibly can. 
And I think we've done that in this case, and I don't think anybody at the table here would disagree with that. We don't. Thank you. Um, so, one thing. I, I want to just address uh, organic farming, because there, clearly, there's a lot of support for organic farming here, and, and I applaud that. I, I support all agriculture, conventional and organic. And before I was the Ag Commissioner in Sonoma County, I was the Ag Commissioner in Mendocino County. So Mendocino County is obviously very big on organic production. They've got lots of acres. They need to stay in organic wine grapes and some other crops. But I just think um, I need to dispel a couple of myths about organic agriculture. One is that they don't use pesticides. Organic agriculture uses probably more pesticides than conventional farming. And I think that's important for everybody to understand. The products they use are not as effective, so they have to apply them more frequently. So, so that's something to bear in mind. And also, the, the pesticides that are used in organic farming, they are not without their impacts on the environment. On okay. um, so I, I really want people to bear that in mind. There are some materials that are used in organic agriculture that are toxic, that are harmful to fish. So I, I just want people to be objective when they talk about agriculture and think about pesticides. Um, one person mentioned here already, uh, California Code of Regulation 6614, no application shall be made or continued when there is a reasonable chance of drift affecting non-target private property and so forth. So the point I want to make is there are regulations on the books already to address pesticide drift, um, to stop applications when when um, the conditions aren't appropriate, and to take enforcement actions when people do violate the law. I think, um, in my estimation, uh, I've been working with Paul Haas Winery and their folks on the VESCO plans. There have been a lot of requests that have come forward that are above and beyond what we require under VESCO. In my estimation, Paul Haas Winery has, has been very gracious and very accommodating um, with voluntarily um, agreeing to not only enter into an MOU with the school about spraying, and I think that's another point I'd like to make. We have a lot of farmers in this county that have been farming around schools for many, many years, and doing so successfully. They've developed a relationship with the school. Most don't spray when the kids are in session, so I, I just want to make sure that the farmers get credit for what they're doing out there already, and also to assure people that all of the laws and regulations applicable in this site we're discussing tonight will be enforced. My, you can call anytime if you ever see anything that causes you any concern, pesticide, drift, anything related to the regulations that the Ag Commissioner's Office enforces, please call. Are ever numbers that I've seen before. That doesn't mean they're not factual. 
but, um, but I certainly can't agree or support all of those numbers. I think that one of the key components here is that agriculture is not a bad thing in this community. It's a really critically important part of our community. Wine grapes and grape growing is a critically important part of our community as well. And I think that with more good neighbor practices, we can get closer and closer to becoming a, 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 a community that can work together. Ralph, I've got to ask you to please stop shaking your head. So currently, it's really, it's, it's very rude. So could you please stop shaking your head? Thank you. No. I can move my head. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to my request. It's just distracting for me. <laughs> so the conversion from apples to orchard will take. Oh, sorry, from an apple orchard to a vineyard will take place this summer during non-school hours. We have agreed, uh, entered an MOU with the school that no spraying will ever take place during school hours. They will always know what's taking place. Well, that we will be spraying well in advance. Um, we will be, uh, we have a number of drift preventative measures in place, including using water trucks and really dampening the entire area. Thank you. And we are also, as I've explained, thank you, one minute. As I've explained, we, are, we do farm sustainably. We are in the process now of being certified sustainable. We're very proud of that. And I think that I, as a parent for that school, I'm thrilled that Paul Hobbs Winery is the next door neighbor for that school. I know that Paul Hobbs Winery will take impeccable care of that property and will provide wonderful education opportunities for the, for the, the schools near, nearby, for the children nearby. And at, I'm speaking as a parent here, not as a member of Paul Hobbs Winery, but uh, this is a wonderful step forward for our community and for our school children. Um, we, Cassandra mentioned a number of other things to prevent drift, and I just want to say that while we are a private business, we are, have been very transparent about who we are and what we're doing, and we will continue to improve our vineyard management practices as time goes on and as we learn more and more about the property and, um, and as uh, sustainable farming and organic farming practices evolve as well. So thank you for taking the opportunity to, <laughs> taking the time to listen to our perspective, I would like to, um, I'd welcome uh, some more people from vineyard and orchard and farming to speak as well. So uh, thank you again. I'm David Smith, and I'm the president of the Twin Hills Union School District. And we're kind of person in the middle. Um, we own a lot of property. There are schools that are adjacent to this conversion site. A little bit of history. Um, the school board became aware of the conversion possibility about two years ago when we started to have conversations with the previous owners. It was our desire, but we were unable to purchase the land for our own purposes, financial situations being what they are in the state, particularly in the educational field. Uh, and so therefore the land uh, opportunity slipped away from us, there was nothing much we could do. We found out about uh, Paul Hoff's acquisition only recently, uh, I'm guessing somewhere about six months ago when we started to have initial discussions about property lines and ways to uh, fix the fence landscape the entrance to our school, which Paul, Paul Hobbs approached us on with some ideas and, and offered to uh, uh, underwrite some of that. Um, so we have been aware of it, but we were not aware of the health issues until I would say about a month, a month and a half ago, when the WCA drew to our attention their concern about contamination of the soil and the possibility of drift from pesticide usage. Um, the response by the board has been, I think, uh, one of dismay in the sense of some guilt, I have to say, uh, that we've allowed in previous years the amount of pesticides to be used next to our schools on the apple orchards. Um, 
if you feel responsible, we get you are not aware of it, the amount, the quantities, some of which you saw, some of which are in the handouts. Um, but we're now aware of it. We are aware of the fact that the replacement crop will be better for our kids, but that doesn't mean that it is going to be the ultimate or the best solution. So we are on a learning curve. We don't have answers at this point. I would like to underscore what Tara and others have said. This is a working process. We are still negotiating. We do have a, um, an understanding, a memorandum of understanding uh, on certain issues already. Tara's looking at some of them. They will notify us in advance. There are other details that we're still working out. Uh, we're concerned a little bit about our water table. Um, we're concerned about some of the uh, future pesticides to be determined. But that's work in process, and we are now, we have our antenna up. We're in constant communication, both with the Alliance as well with the, the winery. So I would like you to know that as a member of the board um, and representing my fellow four other board members, we, we are very concerned, and I would like to think we're doing a, a diligent job in keeping abreast of what's going on and listening to the alternatives. I do like the ideas the Eye Commissioner has mentioned. There is a possibility that we can follow some of the other counties in California and we can pull together the communities, the farming communities, the, um, the governing community, the school boards, both the county and specific school boards, and work on safety zones uh, around our schools, those that are adjacent to farmlands. Thank you. to the 
soil testing. Sorry. We have asked for comprehensive soil testing. We've approached um, Paul Hobbs Winery directly. Um, their response is that um, they're willing to look into it and they're looking to guidance at present unless something has changed from the Agricultural Commissioner, uh, which is why my point was, although you cannot force someone to do something in this case, we're asking for your endorsement that this is a prudent and important thing to do. And in terms of drift, I'm not qualified to answer that. techniques we use to collect these samples. In the past, somebody mentioned the drift that happened on the school in 1998. Uh, my assistant, Lisa Korea, actually responded and investigated that drift and actually took the samples off the windows of the school during that investigation. And those samples did come back positive. So we have a very, very uh, thorough investigation of all allegations of drift. And we also take enforcement. We, the, the person has a right to a hearing where we present our evidence and they present their evidence. But laboratory evidence is very hard to dispute. So um, generally that's how drift cases are handled, with an investigation, with interviews of witnesses, and with laboratory sampling. What's the penalty? Uh, the penalty is up to $5,000 per violation. Probably difficult to measure drift before it happens, but well, maybe you can ask questions later. Um, Hi, I want to thank all of you. My name is Liz Levy, and I am a, a parent of Nathaniel, who is was a student at Richard View, and I also have a son at Annalie, and I live uh, in Sebastopol, and I'm grateful to you guys for putting this together. Um, so, I have lots of thoughts on this, this issue. Um, my thought was, as you were speaking to me, like, well, that's after the drift has already happened. And so the damage has already been done. And I think that there's really enough evidence out there. Um, we don't need any more evidence about the damage that pesticides do to our bodies. We don't need to know more. We know that it causes cancer. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. Look it up on the computer. You will find tons of research that has been done about the dangers of using Roundup in proximity to people. So we're talking about our future here. We're talking about the risk of cancer. We're talking about all kinds of things. And to me, that's just not acceptable. So I really think that it's time that in Sonoma County, we raise the bar a little bit. And we say, we say, okay, these have been the standards up until now. Well, what about what we now know about the damage that happens to our Earth, the damage that happens moving forward into the future that can't be erased because glyphosate doesn't go away. It stays. It doesn't go away. It's, it goes into the water supply. So I just, I, I am hoping that this is an opportunity for all of us to say, we need to raise the bar here. We need to have higher standards. We need to take better care of our children and of our earth. Yeah, it would really be helpful if you hold applause for one thing is going to destroy this cake. So that's for one thing. Hi, my name is Magic, and I've been an activist in this county, especially around the issue 
pesticides for many years. And I want to commend all of you mothers for coming forward. This is real activism. When something happens in your face, and you do something about it. We need to ask the question in anything we do now, how does it affect our children? We can no longer make property rights the bottom line. Conversation is necessary. I spoke to Tara during the break, asked questions about how much Paul Hobbs is worth. She didn't know. If you're interested in numbers, you might want to find that out for yourself, Tara. Um, and what, what, if the parents were informed, she said the parents had been informed, and these questions asked, were, I was then told I was aggressive and rude. But I will continue to ask questions. I would tell you that one of the committees you should have is activism, because we need to stop this. And there's enough people in this community to help you stop this. If Paul Hobbs wants to do something for the community, that land should be converted into a permaculture garden to teach children how to remediate so soil and how to create real food for us, for this community. We don't need any more grapes. And we can do this. So in terms of um, investigating CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, this should be applied here. And it is common sense. We already know there's poisons in those soils because they've been sprayed for years. We know what this does. We know every one of our bodies is filled with toxins. Anyone who has a test knows that. Common sense is what mothers know to protect their children. And you women cannot be stopped, and we're going to stand with you to stop this thing from happening. Uh, greetings, uh, Ernie Carpenter, uh, Creighton, California. For those who don't know me, I've been a planning commissioner. I was on the board of supervisors for six years, 16 years and also uh, Civil Service Commission. And I'm telling you that because I feel like I know government. And on this Hobbes conversion, and I say it this way, unfortunately, it's a ministerial act and that permit will be issued. I do not think that through the offices of Sonoma County that there's any way to stop that at this point. And that's through the administrative process of the county. And I'm telling you that for a reason. <clears throat> I'm gonna back up now and relax over there, timekeeper. Uh, 1970, 1970, you've got 10 minutes like everyone else. Stay out of my talk. In 1970, I'm sorry, but, but you're being, you're just getting into my thing here. If you'll back off, I'll take my two minutes, thank you. In 1970, the plan was to turn Sonoma County into five-acre ranchettes. I hope you all know that. Some of you weren't born. Think about it, five-acre ranchettes throughout the county. We stopped that through a general plan and zoning with large lot zoning. It worked. So in fact, we are a victim of our own success. We kept ag land in Sonoma County because that's what people wanted. We became a victim of our own success. Even though I don't think you can do much on Hobbs, there's a picture down the road, which is all schools. This county is a victim because it does not have the rules in place to deal with vineyards encroaching upon, and I'll call them sensitive facilities. Because if you're out and you have a school or a place for old people or a, a mental health institute, some of these are around, the county needs to revisit this and initiate setbacks. So in stage two, when we take on the industry, I personally am not going to say bad grades get out because this is good for the economy. But I am going to say there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't deal with ag practices and setbacks from schools or one of those kinds of things that we need on the books now and we need it Thank you. Good evening. My name is Colleen Fernald. I live in Sebastopol. Thank you very much for forming and for holding space for comments. My daughter was Charlotte Molinari. She passed away last year. And I chose Sunridge as her school for 7th, 6th uh, through 8th grade because it was in the country in addition to other qualities that had about it. And um, during her play one night up to the, I don't know, across the street from Sun Ridge, there was a plane spraying some white substance, very thick, lining the air. I don't know what it was, but it always concerned me ever since then. Now, if you want to know about Paul Hobbs' practices concerning John Jay the property, contact me. Colleen Fernald, my phone number is um, in the phone book. And you can see my comments on WACO, which did a good service to let people know about this. I am a Peace Voyager. 
Toxic soil will make toxic grapes. I think you want to know what's in that soil. I think consumers of your product want to know what's in the grapes that they're consuming. You talked about um, the impeccable care that you think that they're going to give this property. Was it impeccable care they were demonstrating in the Pocket Canyon Ranch when they took down five acres of trees, or was it more than that, without permits? And then the Christmas Tree Ranch, and then the Paul, the John Jacob property is a completely different story. It goes to so many levels of corruption, I can't even begin to discuss in these few minutes. But it needs to be addressed, and he's the bad apple. But it's not going to end there. So what we're working on here for Sonoma County, we do need for the whole state. This is important for every child, not just the children here. And there will be no end to the way they will try to get away with this, and they do. Because Paul Hobbs' workers got fined for deforesting. Not Paul Hobbs, is the way I understand it. And you can talk to the district attorney about that, because they put an environmental crimes uh, commission together, but then they just put their hands behind the back and didn't go after the culprits. So thank you. This is far from over. It's going to take a lot of diligence to change these practices. And talk to my friend Janice here if you want to know about brands that we can support that really are sustainable and organic, dry farming, because it's not about dissing agriculture. It's about a balance and it's about protecting our children and our neighbors. Thank you. My name is Joe Shai. Um, I grew up out on uh, out of sight of Sebastopol, and I went to Apple Blossom and Twin Hills. And a number of times, riding the buses to schools, and also my mom was driving to school, there was um, sp they were spraying the orchards when the school bus went by, and those buses would just get drenched in spray. So if it's set back at schools, it's got to be set back everywhere. I mean, I mean during times, I mean, a bus loads of kids, um, and then. When I was, um, my mom got pregnant and we, our house was neighboring an apple orchard. Um, and they used organophosphates for spraying. And um, those have been known, have been known to cause birth defects in animals. Um, my brother died at seven weeks old due to kidney failure. So I don't know all the uh, details. The doctor said there may be um, linked to uh, pesticides, but how do we really know? Hi, my name is Vince Schulten. Uh, I'm a local farmer here. I'm a ranger. Um, I had a child at Apple Blossom, another one at Twin Hills. Um, I hear a lot being said, and I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but the setbacks here are ridiculous for what's happening. Uh, I've been sprayed three different times by the adjoining vineyard to me, which I have a quarter acre buffer zone between me and them, and the ad commissioner has done zero, zero, no hearings, no nothing. I had to tell them what I wanted for it to stop. So our ad commissioner is not standing up for people that do not want to be sprayed. in all its facets, I am not into you spraying my children at their school or their revenue being on their desks or their play structures or work something out. Talk to us. I'm done. Thank you. I'm Craig Litwin. I'm the timekeeper. I'm going to take Vince's extra minute since he didn't use it. Does that work? All right, just kidding. Okay, starting my own timekeeping here. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. It's not easy to come at it from different angles, different interest groups, different perspectives, and work to find resolution. I've been working with WCA. I've been working with the County Ag Commissioner. I've been working with local farmers. I'm a former elected official. I was with Joshua on that bus and saw the pesticides drift over me when I went by Emily High to Emily, or excuse me, Apple Blossom School. I have kids in the school district. I served on this council. I'm a lifelong resident, and we need to figure something out. You know, we really have to figure out how to implement more IPM practices, integrated pest management practices. 
we're not going to go organic overnight, and I hear that there are problems with organic too, but I think it is better. We're not going to go organic overnight, and while we get there, working with IPM practices is one way that we can find some common ground in this transition. Uh, we certainly need to expand upon our buffer zones around sensitive areas. Again, it's not going to happen overnight. Being certified organic is something that we did present to Paul Hobbs Vineyard and, er, and asked them if they would be willing to consider that, uh, that along with soil tests. And I appreciate the receptivity to those suggestions and requests. We need a larger forum. You know, this is great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate having the presentation and then having it open up to more, you know, to the Ag Commissioner and others being able to get up and speak. Let's get some debate. Let's figure out how we're really going to get to the brass tacks and, and figure out some solutions that work for everybody. You know, there's more that I can say. I can go on a long time. But I, I'm confident that here in Sonoma County we can find ways to help protect the youth and support local agriculture. And it's marrying those two, just like the recycling program took off. When we remind the youth of our community that ag is the backbone of all of us, we all eat every day, at least those of us who are fortunate enough to, then we can find that honor and respect in the ag community and start from there as a basis for solutions that really help the kids. Thank you. Thank you for not applauding. She says quickly. How many more people have questions or comments? I know. One. And you've already spoken. Um, one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, the problem is that we're supposed to be out of here um, by five of nine. No. Nine? Extend the time. Extend the time? Okay. There is no problem. Um, I just have the calendar. But it's going along reasonably well. I know that some of the panelists have things they would like to say. So how about we go through one more round and then um, allow the panel to make comments, responses, anything that has come up while this conversation is going on, and then we'll move forward. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Eileen Morabito from West County. Thank you, mothers, for taking this on. Um, will you protect your children? I'll turn the mic down towards you. Thank you. Thank you, mothers. And I hope that um, this will move much forward into more policy making. And I really agree that we really do need policy. We need rules. But you know what else? We need some teeth behind that. Big fat cap wineries, great rules, lap all the way to wherever they go to pay the fine. I think $400, $5,000 is not enough. I think we have to be serious about it. I think we have to have jail time yes. for people who violate the environment and violate the people. Thank you. Thanks for taking this time. Yes, my name is Paula Tucker. I'm a parent at Sunridge School. My son wants to grow up and be a farmer because we have an amazing farm program that happens right across the street from where the winery will happen. I am not against farmers. I think it's great. 